Welcome to Talking Heads, a project of the Africa Center based in Cape Town. Each week, we bring you the experts, mavericks, and the thought leaders who are demanding we think differently about who and what it means to be African. If I think of going home to Nigeria, I start wondering how soon after I land would I get a packet of suya? Where would I get my favorite plantain chips? Who will pound yam for me? And in which buka can I drink goat head pepper soup? I want to visit in the right season so that the agbalu moors and mangoes are ripe and the cashew fruit in rich abundance. Food is a connector, a depository for memories and acute longings. It holds culture and identity. And apart from a source of sustenance, is also an excuse for creativity. Karen Dudley is the well-loved chef, or cook as she likes to be called, behind Dynamic Deli, The Kitchen, and the newly opened dining room in Woodstock, Cape Town. She's also the author of A Week in the Kitchen. Food made with generosity and attention, she writes, has the power to grow a community and to make people happy. Karen had the chance to make Michelle Obama happy when the American First Lady made a state visit to South Africa with her mother and children and chose to visit Karen's boutique eatery. Karen was interviewed by Uma Ramia about her delicious creations, her great success, and where her inspirations come from. I invite you to listen to that conversation. Hi, Uma. I'm Karen Dudley. We opened the kitchen about four years ago, and much to our amazement, people were nearly knocking down the doors, wanting to have some of our delicious food and wanting to see our very interesting space. Were you a chef before the kitchen? Is this something new? This is this something you've been doing for a long time? I've been making food for a long time, and I'd been catering from my home in Woodstock, also just up the road from the shop. And my little enterprise was growing quite considerably, and we had lots of fridges, and my poor sweetheart didn't know which milk he could use. Hmm. And if he could eat this or not eat that. And my children were growing up with my staff, you know, sitting, having lunch under the vine. And I realized we need a bit of space. Mm. And then it made a lot of sense to, to have a shop, mostly really just to show off and <laughs> all our beautiful things. Of because course. instead of making special dinners um, and having a very exclusive offering to a few people, we could make our delicious food available to lots of people and much more affordably. The shop looks like an old granny's kitchen with lots of paraphernalia and pictures and it's very bustling and there's always great music about and always lots of people. So it sounds like your focus is community. Yeah. What we found is that people really use the space as a place where they can connect. I see community as the people that you see every day. Um, you know, maybe it's the, the conductor on the bus, maybe it's the people on the train, the people that you see on the street every day, the parking attendant. But for us, you know, I feel very privileged. I have all these people coming to see me every day, <laughs> coming to eat our food every day. And it's such a privilege for me to make something delicious for them. I think that was one of my early kind of a revelation to me that I really just love to serve people. It gives me such pleasure just to share something that's just come out of the oven, you know. I just want people to taste it. Tell me about food and community. Mm. How does food build community for mm. you? We're kind of pioneering in a way a new South African palate we realize that food is where we connect. Food is the thing around which we build community. Mm. And there are so many things that we share. We share similar flavors or things that we didn't even realize we shared. We share through flavor. And I find this tremendously exciting. So I, you know, I'm your typical colored South African girl. And so I've taken some of the things that my mummy taught me and then I put a little contemporary edge on it and make it globally fit in with, with a whole international set of flavors. 
And I suppose I gravitate towards certain flavors and it's kind of a discipline to sort of learn about other flavors too. But I think there's been such a celebration and understanding that, yeah, this is our South Africanness, you know, this is, this is, this is the flavor, this is what we like to eat, you know, and this is what we can share. So much happens around the table. And you can talk about even the most mundane things, but it's in the sharing that ideas are being shared, that worries are being shared, that joys are being shared. You mention this concept of a South African cuisine, which I know at this point is a bit hard to define, and it sounds like you're doing a bit of work around that. Mm. Have you encountered any other chefs or people in the food industry who are also thinking about this construct that you're working with, or is this something you think you're sort of pioneering in a way? Well, I'm sure that there are people who, who are very earnest, you know, like real chefy chefs. I sort of regard myself as a cook. Mm. You know, I'm a mm-hmm. cook mm-hmm. and I have little chefy traits, but, and they are chefs who are quite seriously looking at this. And I, there's some very exciting work that people are doing in sort of finding traditional flavors and herbs from the felt, you know, where you can actually taste the buhu in the jam, you know, and I I find that very exciting. But I think it's different for everyone. I think there's a sort of way things used to be a thing of shame or things we don't even want to worry about, you know. We're rediscovering everything from the crayfish sandwiches that used to go up to Boer Cup and herbs that people used to use on farms and I find that very exciting. That might not be shared for everyone, you know, they may be unique to different communities but what I like to think of as celebrating is just to sort of feel our flavour, to feel what it is that we like. So typically in the Cape we tend to like a little bit of sweet and sour together. We like where those things play off together, you know, so a little bit of spicy, a little bit of fruity. Mm-hmm. But then we also need things that are sour, like a sumac slaw, which is kind of a sort of Levantine kind of flavor, really. But that works, the sourness of the sumac slaw just can set off a, a biryani rice, you know. Where it is that the food is coming from as well um, is really important. I want to go back to something you said just a couple of minutes ago about mm-hmm. shame yeah. and certain foods that people used to be ashamed of. Yeah. Can, you, can you explain a bit more what you meant by that? I think, um, for example, my mom grew up kind of at the bottom of Boca in the Smith Street, and she tells these stories about fishermen bringing up these crayfish sandwiches from the docks. I think they were two cents. Oh <laughs> these crayfish sandwiches on soft oh. white bread, and like people would sort of almost scorned them because they were kind of poor people's food. You know, now they would be prized amazing things, you know, and... And very expensive. And desperately (laughs) expensive, as you can imagine. Just for the sort of concept of sort of, my gosh, you know, the indulgence of having a succulent crayfish tail Mm. on on soft, soft white bread with butter and mayonnaise. Can you imagine? How long ago would would there have been shame surrounding a crayfish? Yeah, so I think probably kind of the 50s and the 60s, the kind of early days of apartheid, I imagine. things have changed quite a bit. Yeah, things have changed quite a bit. But, you know, there are many things that people would just kind of take as, you know, they just hum, they just humdrum things that we make at home, you know, like boba or, you know, various rice dishes or stuff with snook, people would have thought, that, oh, you know, people would never eat these anywhere else. But we're realizing, no, we can use the snook. The snook is fantastic. We only get it here in the Cape. You know, we, we, we've got to use this. Do you find that since post-apartheid or maybe even before that there's more space to explore with mixing different cultures and different foods and yeah. that you have a bit more freedom? Is that fair to say? I think that is fair to say. And... I think also, you know, in the in the sort of wider world, you know, there's the, the world of the celebrity chef and food channels and things like this. I think there is a much greater awareness of the possibilities of things that we can do with food. And I think that's tremendously exciting. So I, for example, I am like a real mix up, a real cultural mix up, you know, and my father came from Canada, my mom was a city girl. I'm like a true new rainbow child, you know, I'm like the way we want things to be, you know, and and I think that sort of sense of celebration Mm. of like, yeah, so we are this big mix-up, you know, how fantastic is that? So in the big mix-up, we can have Thai and we can have Indian and we can have Italian and we can have Spanish, so what? 
And then you can also have flavors that are distinctively yours that Absolutely. are emerging. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you construct an imaginary dish for me that draws from Black African culture and Black South African culture, colored South African culture, Afrikaans culture? I would propose probably three different things <laughs> on your plate. Give me three things. <laughs> so I would have my smoke snook kedgeri. Kedgeri is a bit of a British thing, a bit of a British Indian thing. So we do yellow rice with smoked snook and nebos chutney and a rude amount of cream, probably, <laughs> and lots of fresh coriander. Um, so that would be one sort of capy English Malayish kind of a dish. A dish, right? And then I've been doing something with samp and beans. I make Mexican samp and beans, and you sort of soak samp and beans much as you would, but you, you know, you have lots of parsley and coriander and a little bit of avo and a little bit of sour cream and all the things that you do with Mexican things. Then I would propose a shaved beetroot salad with julienne butternut and a sort of a caraway mousse confit dressing. Mousse confit is a is a kind of a syrupy jam made from green Hanapuat grapes, which are only found here in the Cape. You know, anything that's kind of samp and beanie and sort of smoury, you know, with mm -hmm. tomatoes, mm -hmm. is a little, I think is a little bit african -y. That sounds like a beautiful meal. <laughs> I hope that you'll cook it for me someday. I look forward to that, Uma. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Karen. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Lovely chatting to you. Thank you, Uma. To find out more about Karen Dudley and other Talking Heads guests, to view our video casts or find out about our next live event, visit www.talkingheads.org.za.